Okay, so um, today's lecture is going to be about a topic that is extremely dear to my heart. Um, this is basically the thing that brought me all of my success to this day. So I am extremely passionate about it, and these are the three components to having massive success in basically anything. So this is like a three-step formula that I came up with um, about five, six years ago. And it started as like this idea. I, I didn't actually know whether it was true or not, but I tested it and fortunately uh, I was correct. And that small hypothesis that ended up being correct is pretty much the basis of all of my success. So um, I would like to start by uh, giving you an analogy for three types of cars. So the three types of cars basically represent the three types of people. And imagine this like an onion where you peel a layer and then another layer. So 95% of the people are the cars that are driving on neutral. So I put up this uh, funny picture of a fat Nigerian kid trying to push a car because that's sort of the way I view most people when they um, try to become successful or just live their day-to-day -day lives um, not following the steps. So uh, that's, like, that's number one. Uh, number two is people who are driving on first gear. So these are like uh, people who are on neutral, that's like 90, maybe 95% of the population. That's uh, uh, probably your mom, uh, your neighbors, uh, your college teacher, pretty much every person you know uh, uh, is driving on neutral. So they're just living their lives, not really doing anything special, uh, just sort of withering away. Uh, their health is slowly decreasing. Uh, they don't have any goals. They probably hate their wives or husbands. Um, you know, many are depressed. Many are overweight and debt. So you're basically looking at the human condition. That's like 90 to 95 percent of the population in our Western civilized world. Now, there's a second layer of people. These are people who are driving on what I like to call first gear. So these people uh, are maybe like 5% of uh, our society. And that's, first of all, you guys, if you're listening to this lecture, because you're people who want to develop themselves, uh, become better. You know, you have uh, goals, you have things you want to accomplish. Uh, you're reading books probably, maybe working out. So you're on a path where you're developing yourself. And there's this illusion that if you just keep doing what you're doing, you're going to become successful. Now, I'm very sorry to say, but that is not true. That is an illusion. Because... Um, like 99% of people, probably 99.5% of people are missing the crucial ingredient that would put them on the full gear. So the analogy I use here is most people are driving on neutral. So it's like they're either, they're like pedaling hard, you know, they're working, they're trying to get their pension, uh, they're watching TV and they think that complaining is doing something. So they're putting out a lot of energy, you know, because people put out energy no matter what. So they're putting this energy, but it doesn't amount to anything. You know, you, they watch the TV and they get angry about the news. So they, you know, like, like they get angry with their wife about, you know, some stupid thing about politics or they work and they bitch about their job. So they, these people just, like they spend their energy on neutral. Nothing is actually happening. Uh, worse is that when you're too long on neutral, you're usually going to end up in a downslope, which happens around age 30 or 40. So these people not only keep pumping the gas because they're working, 
they're in debt, they're fat, they hate their wives, but they're also on a down slope, so they're putting all this effort, but they're on neutral, so they're going back, uh, and they don't know why. That's 90 to 95% of the population people. Welcome to modern civilization. Now, uh, most of you guys, uh, I would guess roughly 95% of you guys, so 95% of the 95% are driving on first gear. So you're putting as much effort as the people on neutral, but you're putting it in developing yourself, which is nice. You know, you're reading books, you're uh, working out, you know, you're doing stuff to progress. Um, but there's this illusion that you're actually progressing and that one day, someday you're going to become successful, you know? But the only reason you feel like you're actually moving forward is because relatively to the people who are standing still or moving backwards, you're moving forward. But that doesn't mean you're getting any closer to your dreams. You know, if you drive in your car and, and the road is empty, you feel like you're driving fast. But then if a Lamborghini passes by you, like, you're like, okay, so I was probably not driving that fast. So um, that's like 95% of, of the 95%, which is pre pretty much most people in self-development. Now, if you look at your life, like truly look back at your life last year, the year before, the year before that, look at your income. How much has your income increased? I would say roughly 15%. Look at your health. How much did it increase? I would say roughly 15%. Look at your relationships. How better have you become socially? I would say roughly 15 fucking percent. So um, when you add up, adding like 15%, 50%, 15% every year for like 20 years, you would get an improvement of like, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the number, but I guess it's about 10 times. Now, if I'm currently making like $4,000 and in 10 years from now or 20 years, I'll be making like 40,000, that's nice, but that's not nearly close to my potential because I know people who went from zero to like 100,000 a year, a month, within like a year or two. And I know people who had a, an, a bad body, like obese people who in two years became ripped. So why are you um, feeling, you know, it's good enough to improve by 15%? That's not good enough for me because I know I can do 15% a month. That's more uh, realistic. That is your potential. So you could only improve by 15, 15%, but we will get to that later. So um, the last um, part of the population, which is the 95%, the 5% of the 5% of the 5%, I think. Uh, that's like the billionaire entrepreneurs, the successful athletes, people who made it big, writing books, doing real estate, you know, the people who truly are exceptional. And there's no jumps in life. I'm sorry. There's no sudden magical moment where your success is like uh, suddenly appearing. I would not want that. That's like winning the lottery. I would not want to win the lottery. I mean, if I, if I would have won the lottery, I would maybe took that million and like put it aside or invested it, but I would not want to choose to put my faith in a lottery. So what you're doing by improving by 15% every year and hoping to one day magically become a multimillionaire or a, or a famous athlete or a famous writer, you're basically relying on luck, on luck which frankly like one in a million gets. So these are not odds I would want to play on. So what you need to do is go to the next level, which is driving on full gear. So you're currently driving on first gear. That means you're pushing, you know, you're pushing very hard. You're reading your books, 
you're working out, you know, you, I, I'm honestly, uh, I believe you that you're putting as much effort as you could, but the people on neutral, I also believe that they're putting as much effort as they could, but they're just driving the wrong vehicle, just like you. So because you're progressing and they're not, you think like, Okay, so I'm, maybe I'm on the special scale. No, no, you're not. You're not. Because if your income is not increasing five times every year, you're not doing something right. And I'm not saying you could improve everything in your life like five times, you know, like the body and relationships and money. But if there's one thing in your life that is important to you and you're not improving at least at least three, four, or five times a year. <sighs> You're not going to get anywhere, man. So uh, you need to get on that full gear. And we're going to get to that right now because I will explain to you my three steps to getting from neutral to first gear and to full gear. So uh, step one, finding your vision and drive. Um, your vision is basically your compass. Imagine in the vehicle analogy that your vehicle is your, your vision is your destination. So when you uh, are driving your car, you should have a destination. So you know where you're going and it's exactly the same thing with your life. So if you don't have an extremely clear vision of where you want to go, how, how are you supposed to get there? I mean, you might get there by accident, but I mean, how many people have become millionaires by accident? You know, and the guys who did probably lost it all. Like nine, I, I think the statistics say that 90% of the people who become millionaires by the lottery, not only lose it all within a year, but they actually uh, are in debt. So um, you need to have an extremely clear vision. Uh, what I would do, uh, to find my vision is try to get very present. So I would go into nature or into a place where I, I feel the most relaxed and lively and happy, but not like excited, like calm, happy, you know? And what I would do then is um, I would think of what future situation can I imagine myself in? where I have this feeling. So for me, my best feeling, my most positive feeling is victory, accomplishment, growth, uh, be, be, being comfortable in uncomfortable situations. That's what really does it for me. So for me, my vision is an empire. It started as a like being a millionaire. And then I'm like, okay, so I can do that. So now it's like not challenging anymore. Then it's like, okay, I want to be a multimillionaire. But then I realized like, why, why settle for multimillion? I want to build an empire. So for me, my vision is to build an empire. So I have a very clear compass in anything I'm doing that says, are you going in the right direction? It could be people I'm talking to, the way I'm spending my time, uh, my day-to-day -day decisions, how hard I'm working, what I'm focusing on, the questions I ask myself every day, it's all coming from your vision because your vision and your, go and your values are basically what uh, uh, changes your direction of, uh, of movement. So once you have a vision um, and you have a very clear vision, I would begin pumping up my drive. So if your vision is like your destination, your drive, I want you to imagine it like um, that famous story about a guy who wanted to be a millionaire. And he met a guru that is a millionaire himself and asked him to teach him how to become a millionaire. So the guru said, I want to meet you at the beach tomorrow and I'll show you what you need to do to become a millionaire. So that guy said, Okay, let's do it. So he came to the beach with his, his best suit, all like tucked up, looking fantastic. And his guru was, 
standing inside the, the beach, like knee deep. And he's like, come here. And the guy's like, what do you mean? C come in the water. And he's entering the water. And he's like knee deep. And he's like, dude, I'm ruining my suit. What are you doing? He's like, come closer. Let's go deeper. He takes him all the way until he's like neck deep. His suit is ruined. And now the guru suddenly just grabs his head, bam, like shoves him in the water. And he holds him there for like half a minute. And the guy's like, oh, and he's trying to break free. And he's trying to break free. And he's trying to break free. Like that's all he can think of. Like, I got to get free. I got to get free. And then suddenly he like kicks him in the balls and he breaks free. And he's like, what the fuck did you just do? Why did you do that? And the guru says, you see that drive you had right now? When you want to succeed, as bad as you wanted to breathe, that's when you'll be successful. When there's literally nothing that will stop you, no excuse that will stop you, that's the point where you'll be successful, not a moment before. So your drive is your fuel. And if you don't have a drive where, let's say, you want to become a millionaire, and it hurts you, it literally pains you not to become a millionaire, you will not become a millionaire. Nobody became a millionaire because it was a nice, something nice that they wanted. You know, everybody is like, oh, it would be nice. It's not fun, okay? Becoming a millionaire, becoming a top athlete, becoming a famous something, becoming successful, truly, truly successful at anything is not fun, okay? It has its fun moments, but it's hard work. It's a lot of risks. It's uh, not anything that any sane people would do. You know, Steve Jobs said, success, the secret behind it is that you have to really, really, really love it because anyone sane would give up. So the clearer your vision, the stronger your drive will be. If I just won like a million dollars, that's not enough to drive me to do what it takes. But if my family is in need and I need a million dollars to help them, or if I really want that car, I want that Lamborghini, you know, I'll do anything to have a Lamborghini. You need to be super specific why you want to be successful, what you want to get. And I don't care if it's materialistic, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. So the stronger your drive and the hungrier you are, the more chances you have of being successful. Now, this is like an exponential curve. This isn't like, you know, your linear curve where like you get a bit more drive, become a bit more successful, a bit more drive, a bit more successful. No, no, no. Until like the top 10, 20 percent, unless you're like, in terms of drive and motivation, one of the top 10, 20%, you're going to get shit. Think of the actors going to Hollywood. How, much mo how many actors in Hollywood are actually successful? Maybe, maybe, maybe 5%. Because it's about the 5% who really want it. Hey, Robbie, can I add something? Yeah, sure. Uh, in the Navy SEALs, because it's the top, top special force, in in the united states to root out all the weaklings and the guys who really really want to join they actually drown you um in the water and that gets rid of like almost 80 percent of the people that don't you know don't want to get drowned because that's part of the requirement that you have to get drowned so and then i was reading an article yesterday they came up with a list of like how to make money within a certain amount of time and one of the articles said, if I stole your kid and you have 30 days to make a million bucks, what would you do? Like the amount, the list was like crazy. Like people came up with like a bunch of stuff. But now if you ask somebody like, if, I, if you wanted to make a million dollars, what would you do? Like the, the answers was completely different from when they actually had like, you know, like a real motive and their kid being robbed from them was like one of the biggest factors. So I guess like what you said could be, family or anything objective so it's just yeah. like the motivation part I, I would get someone to abduct your child like if you want to be a million <laughs> like i'll kill your child you're like thank you yeah that's a great opportunity um actually that reminds me 
um, you know, there's the uh, Yakuza. There's like the mafia in America. And that's like, uh, you know, it's a mafia. It's a nice mafia. It's not anything too big. It's like a small organization. But in Japan, uh, the mafia is actually in the government. It's literally part of the government. And they're legally allowed to take money from businesses. The mafia in Japan. Now, you might ask yourself, what's the difference between the mafia in America and the mafia in Japan? Now, there could be many reasons. But there's one thing that I think is a really good a probable correlation for why the mafia in Japan is so successful. That's because if you want to join the mafia in Japan, you have to cut your finger off to show them that you really want it. So if you're in the mafia in Japan, I would not mess with you. Because that's a tough requirement. You need to be one tough son of a bitch to cut your, hand, your finger off to, become in an, to be in an organization. So I'm asking you, would you cut your finger off to become successful? I'm not saying you have to do it, but I'm saying you'll probably need to reach a point where you would do it if you want to be in the elite. Because the elite, you know, we have 8 billion people here. And the elite, that's like maybe like 5,000 people. You're not born special. You have, you, you're not. You have maybe some set of skills, but any skill you have, I can find you someone who's better. So what drives you apart is how far are you willing to go to make it happen. So think about it. Okay. So yeah, uh, basically my equation for drive, how I measure drive, because people say, yeah, I'm motivated. It's important for me. People like to talk. People talk so much. It makes me want to puke. It's like, yeah, it's, it's important. Yeah, I care about it. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it comes to like the part where it's like time to shut up and take action. And they don't do anything. They don't do shit. So some people, their level of comfort is like putting a lot of money. So they put a lot of money, but they still don't take action. And then some people take maybe a bit of action, but they don't really want to do it. They just do it to say, I did it. So I have a very specific um, way to measure drive. And that is how much are you willing to sacrifice? How far would you go to make it happen? And I can tell you, I would die for my goals. I would literally die. If, if, if that's not as much as you care about it, that you would rather quit your job. Let's say you have a shitty job and you want to do something special. If you don't have enough drive to decide, I'd rather be broke trying to make it happen than stay in my comfort zone, it's never going to happen, dude. I'm sorry. I mean, you might change your mind later and then do it, but at your current situation, you have a 100% chance of failure because there's the, the guy next door who wants it so much more that he'll do whatever it takes and you will not beat him. You do not deserve to beat him. It would be a very cruel world, a very cruel world if you would have uh, the opportunity to beat the guy who would do anything. So I'm very grateful. People say the world is not fair. It's super fair. Everybody gets exactly what they deserve. And what they deserve is what they are willing to sacrifice. Always. Always. Hey, Robbie. Yeah. It's funny that you should say it like that, that you would be willing to sacrifice your life in exchange for what you're wanting, basically. Uh, people with really shitty jobs, they don't really view their life really so worth so much worth anything. And I believe the more that of a higher opinion you have of yourself, the more likely you are to achieve these goals. Like you're saying, your life is worth more to you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I'm thinking of like, uh, you know, Gandhi. Um, who else? Uh, Gandhi, there's uh, Mandela. Yeah, definitely Mandela. People who... Uh, Anwar Sadat. Who? Anwar Sadat. Yeah. And, um, and Dr. Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King. People who basically sacrificed themselves for what they believed in. Now, I would even give a bad example, Hitler. It, it doesn't matter if your goals are good or bad. It depends how much you want it, how much you're willing to sacrifice. Exactly. People will follow you when you're that passionate. So my personal examples of sacrifice, um, when I was 18 years old, like 16, I really wanted to be good with girls. I was very shy, introverted, and I just started going out every day. So I moved into this apartment by myself, not knowing how I'm going to pay the rent, but I found a way. And when uh, the guy who's like my idol, the best pickup artist in the world, his name is Julian Blanc, when he said that he's coming to Israel, me as an 18-year-old, I didn't have any money. But I put down $3,000, which is the exact amount that I saved my whole life. That's what my, fat, my mother put for me, my grandma. I put it. That's all the money I had. I was that um, passionate for it, to pay all of my money at that point and lose any chance of getting into a good school, anything, just for having a weekend with that guy. Um, and the, the most recent example, obviously, uh, would be my current mentor, uh, Matt Pocius, which when I saw that he's a millionaire, a real life millionaire that I'm talking to, I said, hey man, how much is your, like, I just want to talk to you. What do I need to do? He said, it's a thousand dollars for an hour. It took me exactly five seconds to send him the money. I did not ask when, how, what am I going to get? He said, $1,000 for an hour. I gave him $1,000, and that's all I had. And then when he offered me to join his program, and that's also money that I now didn't have at all, I took a fucking loan. And not only that, I took a loan for three months. Because I said, it's going to happen. Either I do it. You know, I have him. I have a millionaire who's teaching me. So either I'm going to do it, and become extremely successful or, 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 or I'm going to fail, sink, you know? I'm going to be in a lot of shit if it doesn't happen. But I know something that you don't know, which is that if I'm in a shitty situation in, in like the worst possible, like something really bad, like I'm, I'm in a $20,000 debt. And in Israel, $20,000 debt is like 50000 for you guys. And for a 21-year-old, that's a lot of money. If I'm in a $50,000 debt and I fucked up, I know something that you didn't know because I've had the previous experience with sacrificing and I know that even if I fuck up and drown, I trust myself to find a way to sink, to swim, to get back up. So if I was in a situation where literally I was in $50,000 $50, debt because I failed, I would still win because I now have to find a way to get $50,000 like that. So I trust my brain to make it happen. That's why I'm so confident taking these bold decisions. And then I said, you know what? Let's up the ante. Let's move to a $700 a night hotel. I'm not making any money, but let's do it anyway. Because now I have to make that money. Not like uh, three months from now. Today. And you know what? It took me exactly a week and a half to start making over $1,000 a day. Would you be able to do that without these sacrifices? Without the risk? Nope. No, no one can. 
if you already had done it before, you could because you already did it. But if you have never done it, sorry. If you want to get, if you're right here and you want to get this much, right now you have to be willing to risk this much, falling that low. You want to take it slow, take it slow, but somebody out there wants it to happen faster. So uh, that guy will probably get there before you. And you know, wh whoever gets there first, he gets like 80% of the loot. That's the so, law of nature. So question, Robbie. Because mm -hmm. uh, you kind of have like the same methodology as Dan Pena, kind of. Because he was saying like, well, uh, he was willing to spend more than he could afford for the best of the best. So I, I really want a Lamborghini. They're, uh, they're about $220,000 here. And I have not even close to that amount, but I can do like a down payment. Would that be smart to do? So that way when I, you know, like if I acquire it, I have it in my possession, but at the same time, I know that I have to work my ass off in order to pay for it because the insurance alone is gonna be two grand a month. And the fact that I probably have to pay at least another, probably another four grand just just for like the minimum 2% each month, and then probably a down payment of like $40,000. Would you recommend that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, shit. Absolutely. You know why? Because you're gonna die in 60 years anyway. That's why not true. have a cool story to tell? I mean, you don't have kids. You don't have uh, someone to take care of. Fuck it. Fuck it. What, what's the worst that can happen? So you have the, the, the fucking Lamborghini. You know, you failed. You failed. You only made like well, $1,000 a day or... No, it's a lot less. Like, to me, these numbers are funny. Saying like, like, you're like, oh no, I'll need to make more than $200 a day. Come on, man. I make $60 a day. <laughs> See, so, I don't... So, so you need to quadruple your income, basically, which is a joke. Can I just jump in here a second? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Why, don't you, why don't you up the ante again? and take a loan from a loan shark instead of a bank. You mean like a, a million dollars? Because they'll kill you if you don't make the money. <laughs> yeah, that's like literally kill you. Um, I don't like borrowing money. It's not my, uh, I mean, I will eventually have to, but yeah, I don't know if I'd go for a shark. If, if you, what I'm saying is that if you have a Lamborghini, first of all, uh, people are going to treat you different. You're going to be oh, able yeah. to make huge deals. It's um, a fantastic tool for positioning yourself. Your I'm perception of yourself will change. Imagine how you'll feel about yourself driving a Lamborghini. I'm going to actually go Friday to look at the Ferrari and Lamborghini, um, mm -hmm. see what they got. So. I, mean, I mean, again, worst case scenario, you don't have the money, so you have to give it away, and now you're in debt. So anyway, you have to make the money. And now you have a cool story about how you owned a Lamborghini for a few months. I mean, who can say that? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, would go, I would definitely go for it. Uh, okay, okay. So, so can we continue? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so the last sentence sort of sums it up very well. You can only get as much as you're willing to sacrifice. <laughs> Okay, that is, uh, that is uh, a very clear rule. So, next up. Uh, build your work ethic. So, now, you, you know, you have that down. You have the vision. You have the drive. Now it's time to talk about work ethic. So, a strong work ethic is basically the difference between being successful or being a failure. So it doesn't matter how much drive you have or um, how well your vision is. If you don't have a work ethic, you know, it's not going to happen. Because a work ethic is what separates the average person from you know, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. Uh, a, work a work ethic is like how committed are you to your work? Like, how committed are you to being there every day, 
putting the effort when you want to do it, when you don't want to do it. Um, so, so work ethic is, is not about working hard, but it's about discipline and not letting your emotions dictate what's going to happen. So um, a person with a strong work ethic, if he, let's say, wants to uh, work out, you know, become like a, an athlete, he will go every day to the gym. You know, he will eat the proper diet every day. But a person without a good work ethic would always look for a shortcut. And when you're busy looking for shortcuts, somebody else is doing the work. You should always keep that in mind, that sentence. When you're busy doing the sleeping, doing the eating, doing the um, anything that's not related to your dream, somebody else is getting there as you, as you do like your thing, you know? So never be complacent. This is a competition. This is a competition. There can only be so many one percenters in the world. Um, so motivation gets you started, work ethic keeps you going. Um, motivation is, is nice, but um, what we re will really make it happen is consistency, having good work ethic, good habits, because just having a good uh, a motivation that's like relying on uh, that's like relying on the sun uh, on the, the the weather being warm. You know, some days it's hot, some days it's cold. If you're reliant on like solar energy, for example, some days it's just cloudy, and you're not going to move forward. But when you have work ethic, you're going to move forward, like no matter what. But at the days where you have both the work ethic and the motivation that's when you really fly these are the days you make like four sales or you know you break a new record so what you're essentially doing is very quiet it's like going every day to the gym it's very quiet you just you know walk into the gym doing your workouts and you're waiting for these days when you have that you know that spark and you just push like five times harder than you usually do. So the gym is a very good um, example of it because it's a very literal example of how someday you just come and you don't feel like it, but you do it anyway. And some days you come to the gym and you can just lift like a lot more, like 20% more. You know, usually improve it by like 3%, something like, like you just jumped up, you know, to a new level. So you have to be consistent, you know, and I would recommend you a book called The Art of War. Ah, sorry, the opposite, The War of Art. So The Art of War is a book by Lao Tzu. It's a, a, an, a general, it's one of probably the best books in history. Um, but The War of Art, that's like the opposite name. That's a book from a guy who's like a famous artist, I think. And he... It's a really short book. It's like 100 pages. And he just goes in depth about uh, what he calls going pro. So going pro is when you decide to do it no matter what. And you can't go pro if you don't make the decision to do it every day no matter what. So you can generally predict a person's potential by their work ethic. So give me somebody with a good work ethic who has accomplished things before. He has the credentials. I'll trust that he'll probably make it happen again. Because if you just give him something else, he, he's already done that effort before. But give me someone who's like, you know, that guy who always starts thing as, things and never finishes. You know, he could come up with the best plan. You know, he's like, hey, man, I know what I want to do with my life. Yeah, it's this. And, and you talk to him like a month later. And he's like, oh, I, I, yeah, I don't like it anymore. Of course you don't because you're relying on motivation. You know, you have to uh, go pro, do it every day if you want to like it. That's the love. So your work ethic is not something you do. It is, some fun. It is who you are. So people who are, let's say, have accomplished a great achievement in one area of their life, they would have had to learn 
the tools and principles, psychological, motivation, emotional, to make big things happen. Which means that, let's say a guy was obese and he made a full transformation in two years and now he's like super fit, ripped. I would give that guy a very good chance of being successful at anything, basically. Let's say you want to be a millionaire. I'm like, okay, he got from obese to, to really uh, ripped. So not only neutral, he actually got into like better shape than anyone else. Becoming a millionaire isn't much more different, you know, becoming good with girls, um, become more, more charismatic, uh, any, any area of your life, you know, getting good at tennis. It's like, it's exactly the same process. It's a different environment. It's different rules, but it's exactly the same process. You know, you just do it every day. You keep learning, you keep improving. And if you did it in one place, you'll probably do it in another place because it's the same principles of success, which is being clear in your intentions, not being dependent on outcome, being present to the moment, being consistent. These are all things you sort of uh, learn when you make uh, big things happen. Uh, so your credentials are very important. So if you've never accomplished anything big, I would start with smaller goals and build up. But if you know that you have a work ethic, um, I would uh, suggest going as far as possible. So I know about myself, for example, that there's no amount of work that is too much for me. I just finished yesterday a 25-hour workday that started like the, the previous day and it was 25 hours. I slept one hour and now I'm here after like 18 hours of more work, you know, and I'm tired and my head hurts, you know, but I'm still here. And when I finish this lecture, I'm going to keep working, you know? So obviously that's not something I'm going to do for, you know, it's, it's not like something I want to do long term, but I've made the decision to do like a sprint. So I'm sticking to my decision. So it doesn't matter how tired I am. I'm, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. And that's the difference between somebody who's successful and somebody who quits. Um, so when you deal with high level people, and usually if you want to be successful at anything, whether it be money, fitness, uh, sports, you have to deal with high level people, you either work for them, have them work for you, uh, be partners with them. They look for work ethic. So anything less than a perfect work ethic, they probably won't want to associate with you. So if you have problem getting up in the morning, getting on, being exactly on time, a few meetings. And by the way, Connor, he actually put up like this beautiful uh, uh, picture, which I actually believe in too, that says like, uh, when you're early, you're on time. When you're on time, you're late. And when you're late, you're fucking fired. So I go by that. I go by that rule. And anybody who's late on me, they're out. There, I will not work with them because I'm looking for someone who matches my level of ethic because having someone who's like late, I view that as a mental weakness, some sort of a retardation. I, I, I will not work with someone below my level of work ethic. Why would I do that? Um, so if you want to work with higher level people, make sure you have perfect work ethic because I think my work ethic is perfect at the moment because a work ethic is not something you can improve infinitely. It's something that's like 0% to 100%. 0% means you'll never do what you say you're going to do and 100% means you're always going to do what you said you're going to do. So you can't go beyond 100%. Maybe if you over deliver, but that's, uh, that's about more about motivation. So you should give your, a very big focus on getting yourself to 100% work ethic, which means that there's 0% chance that you'll be late to the meeting, that you'll not do it because you don't have the energy, uh, anything like that. And when you have a very per a perfect work ethic, your brain will actually create motivation for you because let's say you decide you want to uh, become ripped your brain knows from previous experience that anything you said you're going to do, you actually do. So your brain has proof that you can make it happen. So it's no longer a fantasy 
or something you wish, it's actually a goal. And not only a goal, something you know you're gonna, it's going to happen. And since your brain knows it's going to happen because it did it before, it will give you all the motivation you need. So it's not a struggle anymore. It's actually fun. Okay, so that wraps up building your work ethic. That's like finding your vision and drive and building your work ethic. These are um, the two steps that will put you in driving first gear. Uh, uh, first gear, yeah. But in order to go to full gear, which is the secret ingredient, you would have to recruit your mentor. So that's the step that everybody gets wrong. Everyone gets that step wrong. So it's no wonder that, you know, only one, less than 1% of the people are successful because, again, this is not uh, a coincidence. This is a correlation. Only 1% of the people have mentors and work ethic and motivation and drive. So the axiom uh, I put is declaring that you generally improve by 15% each year. So when you don't have a mentor, and I, I really urge you to look back and actually see, okay, so last year, yeah, about 15% in money, 15% in relationships, 15% in fitness. A year before, yeah, maybe even less, but yeah, about 15%. But the question is, Whose 15% are you improving relative to? When you have a mentor that's making a million dollars a month and you're making $2,000 a month and you're near that person and you're learning from him, you will improve 15% relative to that mentor. So let's say that mentor is making a million dollars every year, every month. You should expect that within a year, you'd be making about $150,000 a month. That brings me to the 10x rule, the 10 times rule of finding a mentor. So when you want to find a mentor, I would suggest finding a mentor who is not 10 times better than you, but 10 times better than your vision. So if your vision is to make a million dollars, I would suggest that you find a mentor that makes $10 million. If your vision is to become in really good shape, don't just find someone who's in good shape. Find a guy who's like an Olympic athlete or ripped. Or ripped. Because, again, the question is, whose 15% are you advancing on relatively? Now, when you're looking for a mentor, there is only one question that will determine whether you'll be able to get that mentor. Uh, I'll just, let me just go back a minute. Um, one quick point I wanted to make is that when you have, uh, let's say, a mentor that makes $10 million and you follow that person for, oh, sorry, that's like the last point. Okay, we'll get there later. So, so when you're looking for a mentor, there's really one parameter that I use to measure what are your chances of actually getting a mentor. And that parameter is how much are you willing to sacrifice? I don't know if it's cosmic rules, if it's psychology, if it's the mentor seeing something in you. When you decide, I will sacrifice anything to make this happen, to get this mentor, you tend to get lucky and you get that mentor. Or let's say in general, you decided I will sacrifice everything to get such a mentor. You would get such a mentor because in life, like Anthony Robbins says, there's your uh, shoulds and there's your musts. Your shoulds sometimes happen and your musts always happen. So if your must is I will get 
a mentor, and that's why I'm always using the analogy, I will kill myself to make it happen, then there's, you're really not leaving any other choice. It's a matter of time. So if your mentor, like let's say you, you came up to some guy and, and he wants to, uh, you know, you, you, you ask him to mentor you. And he sees even by 1% that you're not fully there. You will not give anything. He will probably not take you as his mentee because why would he? There's only one thing your mentor can gain from you, and that's hunger. Because the wolf on the top of the mountain can never be as hungry as the wolf that's climbing up. Your mentor is most likely much older, much more experienced, he's been through shit, he's gotten his goals. He's, your, he's a mentor, that means he, he has anything he could want. So it's harder to get motivation when you have anything you could have wanted. That's why someone like you are invaluable, invaluable to a mentor. So he's not doing you a favor. You're actually doing him a favor because he needs you to keep that fire, that drive we were talking about, you know? Step number one, your drive is like your fuel. The hungry, how hungry you are will determine your success. That is also exact, applying exactly the same to a billionaire. Only that he needs even more hunger because it's in smaller increments now. You know, when you want to become financially successful, for you, Connor, for example, jumping from $60 a day to $500 a day, which is a joke. That's for you, like the, the whole world difference. But give you, I'll give you like a month before you'll get bored and you want more. So imagine if you're making billions. How, how, like what drive could you have to make more money? Unless you become like a philanthropist and maybe then your drive is to help people. But even then, you need that young guy, that underdog, that wolf that is hungry for the, for, to get that food. Because, he, you know, people, they, they're like sponges. They transfer uh, the, the energies from each other. So if you're that motivated that you'll do anything and your mentor is, is, is feeling that vibe, you're actually giving him fuel. And in return... For you, pumping fuel into his Lamborghini, you know, that's his vehicle of, uh, as a person, he's letting you drive his Lamborghini. So how much are you willing to sacrifice? It always comes back to this question. Work ethic, that's bullshit, you know? If you're willing to sacrifice everything, you're willing to sacrifice sleep, you're willing to sacrifice comfort. So, like, you know, you'd give anything. So work ethic is out the window. And, you know, getting a mentor. If you're willing to sacrifice anything to get a mentor, this whole talk is out of the window because you'll get one. It's, there's no, there's no uh, other option. And I don't know many people who go by that philosophy of there's no other option and they don't get what they want. I don't remember many cases of that happening unless that person gave up. So any risk you take to get a mentor, that's my philosophy, is a good risk. If your mentor wants $1,000 just for an hour, pay it. You know, he wants you to move out, move. He asks you to, you know, whatever it could be. Any risk you think you can take to get that mentor will probably be the good decision because even if you fail, you follow your heart. You know, you, you expanded as a person. So if Connor, if you get that Lamborghini, you just expanded. So it doesn't matter the outcome because you as a person just quadrupled your potential of success because you already did that. You bought a fucking Lamborghini and maybe you lost it, but 
but you still did it. So now you're like, oh, so I can take bigger risks. Like, nothing will happen. And, and what did we talk about? Oh, I can't find the, <laughs> the, uh, um, the specific sentence, but we talked about um, your success is a direct measurement of how much are you willing to sacrifice. So if you're smarter because you know that this is all bullshit, there's no real risk, so now you bought the Lamborghini and you lost it, but now you know it's a game. Like nothing will happen. I just did it. You know, Donald Trump was billion dollars in debt, in debt, and now he's like a, bi a multi-billionaire. It's like it's a game. So I'm not saying do anything dangerous, but I'm saying ask yourself what is dangerous. What is like a limitation that will cause me to have like a less interesting life? And what is truly dangerous and the amount of things that are truly dangerous, especially when you don't have kids, that, that's really like 5% of the things you're thinking of doing. <clears throat> Finally, uh, the last topic I want to talk about is when to move on. So your mentor, I like to imagine it like having a, a bird's nest and you're like the small uh, the tiny baby bird and he's helping you grow you're in your small cocoon you know when the question is like when is the time to move on so I would give um, two situations where it's really good to move on one of them is um, when you feel like uh, you've surpassed what your mentor has to offer so let's say you know that in that cocoon, you will make like $1,000 a day, but you're like, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe your mentor is like, you know, because he's helping you, maybe he's also taking from you. So you know that if you just do what he does, but on your own, the rewards will be much bigger, but you'll try have to fly on your own now. So that's a good time to... I won't say leave as in never come back, don't, come, don't talk to him, but as in leave that safety nest, you know, because you're, you're mature enough to fly on your own. And that is also a decision that will make you much more stronger as a person. To let go of that mentor, it's not easy. It's like uh, letting go of a loved one. It's like, it's like sort of a death. Um, the other thing I would suggest is like my Tarzan analogy. So you want to be like Tarzan. You want to be like the NASCAR cars that are drafting. You want to draft on your mentor. Now drafting, that is like when a NASCAR, when there's like a racing car and there's like a racing car behind it and the car behind the, the one on the front actually doesn't get the air resistance because the front car gets all the air resistance for it. So you're basically... Um, moving uh you know behind your that person but that's what allows you to accelerate because you're not experiencing the same resistance so you can actually use it to build momentum and actually pass that person so try to draft on your mentor like try to see how can you use that momentum that massive momentum that your mentor has you know by being a millionaire or a billionaire or whatever how can you draft on that and then take that speed and now getting back to the Tarzan analogy, holding that uh, branch, you know, swinging, getting to the next branch and then letting that go and just jumping to the next branch and then to the next branch, but never letting go until you have another one in hand. So stay with your mentor until you either found a better mentor or you know you can do better on your own because it's like a kid. You know, a kid needs his parents, but at a certain age, if he sticks to that parent, the relationship will be corrosive. So uh, that pretty, pretty much sums up uh, the guide, which is called The Three Components of Massive Success in Anything. Um, I believe it's quite clear that if you make these three things happen, get a massive drive, uh, have a clear vision, have a great work ethic and find your mentor, then there's really, I would say, none, no percent chance of failure. Like 
you have a hundred percent chance of success. So uh, thank you for uh, being in the lecture, and uh, I will see you next time.